finally realized that it's time now for my 80th birthday. So I want to spend it out in one of my most favorite places, the Oregon Desert. So we're going to go out the little two-track road to some property my daughter has bought out here where we have a little camp trailer. This is really neat out here, and you might think there's no animals, but when you get out there and take some time and look around, there are plenty of things out here to see and do. There is now quite a substantial herd of these wild horses roaming free across the desert. Since the sun is setting low over a partially clouded sky, we decided to go down to Coyote Lake and check on it. This is one of our favorite places to be. It's a really nice big playa and just as smooth as Safeway's parking lot. We even have built a land sailor to sail on it with. The sun will soon be setting right behind the Steens Mountains as we go out and check the dry lake bed out. There are miles and miles of this, and this at one time was a very deep lake, but since it has no drain, it filled up with sediments. The water run in there and the settlements would settle out of it until we have a dry lake bed. When there is a big rain, there will be shallow puddles of water set on it, and it can be pretty slick, so you wouldn't want to drive out here when it's rainy weather. It is common to see a solitary group of horses around the edge of the herd. There are horses that of, are too old to fight or been kicked out of the herd. Looks like all is well at the home front, and the Steens Mountains are standing tall in the background with still a little snow. We had just sat down for a moment right in the shade of the camp trailer, and I heard some hooves in the rocks right alongside the fence to our little trailer house and I looked out there and here's a young buck antelope and he's feeling kind of feisty right now. He's fighting a sagebrush and then he'll rub the side of his cheeks on it when he finally gets it beat up and that there's scent glands where those black spots are. That's a scent gland and he rubs on the bush with that, and that leaves some his scent on the bush. And the next antelope that comes along knows whose territory it is. And you better not infringe on his territory, or he'll work you over just like that. It looks like he's fat and sassy and probably ready for a fight. He sure looks slick and nice. And so he's going to work that sagebrush over till it till it behaves. And then he'll rub the side of his cheek, as he's doing now, on the bush to get his scent on it. He does it on both sides. Both sides of his cheek, where those black spots are, are scent glands. And that sagebrush still needs a little working over. And so... If there's another buck watching, he better watch out because that's what he's going to get. Sagebrush he's working on. The snow-capped Steens Mountains are standing tall in the background as the old antelope slowly makes his way out across the desert. You might at first think this is a desert and there's no wildlife here, but there is plenty of it lurking around. A lot of them don't move around till at night, and others do it just when your back's turned. 
We have the little antelope ground squirrels around, and they're experts on peanuts. They're a solitary animal, so usually there's only one in an area by themselves. But since they think maybe if they come in and look real cute, there might be a peanut for them. And so they kind of congregate around where they might find a peanut. And sometimes they'll shuck it out right there and put it in their cheek pouches. Other times they'll haul it off if they're full and bury it for a future time. And I have an idea they have no idea where they buried it. They have a little white tail that goes up over their back with a white fringe on it. And so that works well for signaling. And they're a very small animal, and they do have a lot of young when they have young. And so they're prey for numerous things like different birds and, and coyotes and badgers and uh, just everything. When, when they see the shadow of wings go over, they make themselves real scarce. So we've spotted an old raven's nest high up on a cliff. These ravens use the same nest year after year, and they just remodel it a little bit and fix it up. But they make their living off the desert, and I expect part of their living is Maybe a nice fat ground squirrel once in a while would taste good. An old doe antelope stands by. She has a baby antelope stashed someplace, but she's not telling anyone where it is. She won't even whisper it to me. But as soon as that baby antelope gets big enough to run with the fleet, and they're runners, they're built for running, they have no dew claws, and they're the fastest running animal, that is, long-distance running animal in North America. And when they run, they can run forever and at a really fast pace. She'll demonstrate just a little bit of her very slow run to us. And then we look down, and here's a nice fat horn toad. He's a real nice fat one. And he's running around right in front of our place, picking up ants and little insects. Matter of fact, he's quite interested in our solar panel. So the next thing we know, we look over at the solar panel, and here's a horn toad under it. And then in a little bit on top of it. There are a few different species of these horned lizards out in the desert. And in some areas, you have to be really careful not to run over these if they're crossing the road. Some of them, the numbers are growing quite low on them. And they're a beneficial lizard because they their main diet in in a lot of the species of them are just common ants and they'll they don't eat just any ant they're very specialized on their feeding unless it's exactly the right kind of ant he just won't eat it and he'll starve to death so these animals should never be picked up or messed with and you should be careful not to step on one or run over him. He's up giving this solar panel a good inspection now, and I guess it's probably passing his standard of solar panels. It looks like a nice smooth place to crawl around on, and he shows up real well on there. But he better be careful getting in a spot where he shows up, or a burger or a coyote or a fox or something will grab him and have him for dinner. Some species of these have been known for splitting, 
spitting blood out their eye when they are threatened. The little antelope ground squirrel isn't that clever about his defense. His main defense is his camouflage and his fast movements. For a small rodent like this, whenever they're out in the open, they move really fast. And so they won't sit down unless it's in the shade of a bush or something else because they don't want to take a chance on something spotting them. But that peanut is just so good. And so he's going to find another one. He's, he pretty much fills his cheek pouch, and then he'll grab one and just run like crazy. We're only there occasionally, so they... They don't rely on peanuts as a food. When we show up, they hear us clattering around the place, and then they come out and check it out. It's now time to give them an IQ test. We're going to take a piece of dental floss and tie a peanut down and see how long it takes him to figure out how to get it. So he's already taken the bait but he comes to the end of the line and the peanut, he just, no matter what he does, it won't go any place. So he's going to work it over a little bit and try to figure out a way to get it. He just can't get that peanut to come with him. There's something definitely wrong, he senses now. So he'll work on it until he gets it. There's got to be another way getting that peanut I do I he's saying I really need that peanut so he decides that he'll just sit there and eat the darn thing if it won't come he'll shuck it out and put it in his cheek pouches and you can see his cheek pouches are getting fatter and fatter now as he stuffs more peanuts in it's just like he has full-blown lumps well, that did that peanut. He outsmarted it. Next, a little beetle comes by and checks out. He's wondering where his peanut is. And those darn squirrels are so much faster. They've got... It's now time to give the squirrels another IQ test to see if they've learned anything from the first time they were here. So... We tie the peanut to a piece of dental floss with a little piece of it hanging out and lay the peanut out there. And he does, he's learned already that that peanut probably isn't going to go any place. It wouldn't hurt to give it a try. But he knows exactly what to do with it. He's just sat there and shucked that peanut out and put it in the cheek patch, and then you're going to be just fine. I think he's probably thinking, I hope they aren't all tied down like that. That's going to be a lot of trouble. This species of ground squirrel, according to the book, supposedly never have to take a drink of water in their entire life. They have the mechanism within their gut to make water with the hydrogen from the seeds and things they eat and the oxygen in the air. And so they, um, they don't have to drink water. But that doesn't mean that they wouldn't like a nice drink once in a while because we put water out and it sure gets drank in a hurry. But they'll pack all the peanuts away first because they're just too busy packing peanuts to drink. Then the beetle finally found an empty peanut shell that the squirrels didn't like. And so he's going to work it over. I don't know why he doesn't just pick it up and carry it, because he's got the most definitely has the strength. And they're one of the strongest insects there are in the world. They can pack away things that are, that are much larger than they are 
and sometimes they'll just throw them up over their back and head out with them. That he's got something else in mind, and I'm not sure what it is. He's not doing it right. He should get that up over his back where he doesn't have to lift himself stepping on it. But he'll, he'll work on it here for a while, and then pretty soon he'll figure it out. We saw some stones glittering on the ground and we're searching for them. Look right. This one? Yeah. Nice yeah. one. Oh, it's not much good. But. No, but um, I've got some good ones here. Got a nice. This one's nice. Nice, yeah. Yeah, and I found a really big one. Yeah, this one. That one's got a little bit of a darker amber in it too, or maybe that's dirt. <laughs> yeah, well, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really nice ones. Erica, one of our desert friends. Either you're a desert person or you aren't. And so all of us that are out here really like the desert. Either you love it or you hate it, I guess. But since I was raised in, in an area a little bit similar to this, I really love it. And her little dog's out there. I was putting my sunstones in a bottle, and I made the mistake of setting it down. And it looks like the little dog found it and decided that was his favorite toy of the day. And so I got to figure out how to get it away. Yeah. It's glittering in the sun. There's two okay, okay. Okay, there's two sunstones right here. Look at that. See them? That's a nice one. There. Marge, my wife, is just getting over breast cancer surgery. Uh, she had a double mastectomy, and so I guess she really isn't supposed to be out here, but she couldn't stand not being out here. So I rigged up a spoon for her to pick them up with. I taped this spoon to a walking stick, and she can just scoop them right up. It's just a big old plastic spoon that was laying around, and it works well. We get back, and here we have company again. The old buck antelope has decided to return, and the Steens Mountains have a nice coat of clouds covering them. <coughs> the sunstones that we have found we washed them and laid them out on a paper towel. And for those who might wonder, what do we do with sunstones? Here's what we do with them. We send them, we have a, a place that we send them over on the island of Sri Lanka and have them faceted into different diamond-like shapes. shapes. They're known as the Oregon diamond. So they make really good diamonds, and they're getting quite popular right now. The great part about sunstones is no giant company has a monopoly on them, and you can still find your own, and you can either facet them yourself or find someone to facet them or send them over to the island of Sri Lanka and have them done for a very reasonable price. Those darn ground squirrels are just eating up so many peanuts that maybe we should figure out a way to have a ground squirrel. Well, maybe boiling them in a saucepan would be good, or else fry them in a cast iron skillet. They say they taste just like chicken, but we won't be finding out.
because they're just a little bit too feisty to stay in the pot while we cook them. So I guess that's out. All we can do is watch them pack peanuts away. Last night, Mother Nature took her vengeance out on us and dumped a bunch of unneeded rain right in our driveway going out. But we'll get out. It's okay. It's still solid. And a little herd of wild horses with some very tiny colts make good their getaway as we move on out. The road is flooded for quite a way of ways, but along named for Silver City pioneer Hiram Leslie, who was killed by lightning here in 1882. These colorful formations of volcanic ash have been spectacularly carved by erosion. Lake Owyhee, eight point miles. From here, we slowly start winding down in to the Owyhee Canyon as we go down Leslie Gulch. The rock formations, or there is no exaggeration when they said they were spectacularly carved out of rocks by erosion. And so we'll see good evidence of this. This is a one-of-a-kind place. All sorts of little couplets carved into the rocks by erosion, and then the towers up on the skyline that appear to be reaching to the sky as we slowly move down in to Leslie Gulch. We're keeping an eye out for bighorn sheep because this is bighorn sheep country and we're hoping to find some. But not every trip you see the bighorn sheep. They're probably laying around this time of day up in the shade of some of these giant pillars. Or maybe they've climbed in a little cave just so they'd be comfortable for the day. As you wind your way down, be prepared at every curve in the road to see a different kind of very nice rock formation. The road is good and the scenery, I don't know whether they've made words for that or not, but it's nothing short of the best scenery you've ever seen on this earth. For mile after mile, you see these pillars carved artistically by nature, towering skyward. And it looks like some of them are about ready to topple, but I don't think that happens very frequently. And finally, we reach the end of the road. It's a Waihee Reservoir. We can look across the reservoir and see see still more of these towering stones. We came down here to go fishing for crappie. Usually it's really good fishing, but it's just plain been too cold and wet. And the crappie like warm weather, so they weren't even in. So we never caught even one single crappie, but any time you make a trip down here, it's well worth the scenery. Like this Gunsight Pass that's right by the little campground. The little campground in here just has a few sites with the sunshade over it, and it is free. There's a lot of wild game birds down here, we see a chucker thinking he's hid, right, with his relying on his camouflage to hide him. There are a lot of these game birds down in the canyon, and when they get a little bit alerted or a little excited, you'll hear them going, chuck, 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 chuck. I guess that's how they get their name, chuckers. But he's just going to sneak off and hope to be unnoticed by us. 
As we head out, we see a little road that had a petrified wood digging sign on it. So we're going to go up it, even though it's raining. We're going to try it. Even though the road isn't the greatest you've ever seen, it is pretty rocky underneath, and we're able to go quite a, a few miles on it. But then when we finally got to the end of where we could go, we found there was a real steep downgrade, and it looked like there wasn't too many rocks on it, so we didn't risk going down there. We were afraid that if we got down in there, we wouldn't be able to get back out. So we just backed up and turned around. It wasn't easy turning around and checked out a few flowers and headed back for our little trailer house in the desert. Normally this time of year, this place is just a mass of color from the different varieties of wildflower. But this year it's been so wet and cold that there's hardly any. We're lucky to find but a very few of them. But at least we can still enjoy the country as we move out. Maybe they'll bloom really good later on, but we probably won't be there at that time. Maybe we come back just to see the wild flowers. It would be well worth it just to make a trip in here to see wild flowers and do it on a nice day and maybe find some petrified wood. We get back to our little camp trailer and we check our flowers that are growing around the camp trailer. We see some of the evening primrose are starting to bloom. And they like it when it when there's some rain, but the rain sort of fouled them up a little bit. But still, they're pretty nice. The ground squirrels took good care of things while we were gone, I guess. And the weather's still not settled. There's a brisk breeze blowing, and our poor wind sock, it's been up here for two years, and it wasn't new, and, but it's fluttering away with a rainbow in the background. We brought a new windsock to put up, but we don't know where we've put it. We'll look for it and maybe find it. There's usually plenty of character in the sky, particularly when it's stormy weather, but that's what we come out here for. We stop at a junction in the road on the little road going out to the property. And this is a junction where two old military roads crossed each other. One of them goes out to where our trailer house is, and the other one was the old wagon road, 1860-something wagon road that went to Silver City, Idaho. And they used it to carry mail and also for Indian fighting and then it was used for a short period of time by the Pony Express. Every night it seems to come a rain, and that rain seems to pour right into our little road, but it's still passable and we'll get out. Bucky, our little buck antelope, is looking a little roughed up today, but he's happy. There will be a lot of nice green grass for him to eat after that rain. And so he's going to go out and check his kingdom of the desert out with the Steens Mountains standing tall and straight in the background. But we've got something else to do other than watch antelope and dodge mud holes. We're going to go petrified wood hunting today. So we go down by Disaster Peak, which is standing in the background toward a little freshwater creek and on up till we come to the place where we're going to hopefully find some really nice petrified wood. Some say 
that this wood we find is like the best quality of any place in the world. I don't know about that, but I do know it's certainly nice. It's gem quality stuff, and some of it we send overseas and have it made into cabachon cuts to make jewelry from, and it's real nice. We found the spot, and Marge has to take it a little easy on her digging since her surgery still hasn't healed yet, but she loves petrified wood, and so she's going to do it anyway. I told her that I'd, I'd man the shovel and take the overburden off, but that didn't suit her. She had to do it herself. The fortunate thing, we don't have to dig very deep, and it doesn't take long to get our 25 pound limit, which is all the law will allow. That is, it's 25 pounds per person per day, and then a seasonal limit of, I think it's 250 pounds. But before anyone were to go dig wood, they need to check that out because it's very strictly regulated. So we have are 25 pounds each and it looks like I've been voted on as the one to carry the 50 pounds of petrified wood out but it wasn't far and 50 pounds isn't that terrible heavy. We'll check our petrified wood out when we get to the pickup and we found that we've found at least three or more varieties of wood here, all different types of trees that were covered up and then petrified. And I don't know for sure, I'm no geologist, but I think it wasn't petrified in the spot where we found it. I think it was petrified someplace else and brought in by glaciers because occasionally we see some of it with rounded edges that would indicate Maybe it had been rolled around a bit by glaciers. But wherever it came from or whatever it is, we're fortunate to find it. And it's very, very nice stuff. Back across our little creek where there's a few willows. And then on back to our little camp trailer. The sun was out pretty good today. And it looks like our evening primroses on our lawn took advantage of that. But anyway, we're going out and check the ruins of the old Pony Express station out. And all there is, you can see where they've piled it. And these buildings were made of rock, double wall rock with mud in between for mortar. And anyway, when the roof's gone on these, the rains eventually melt the mortar away and the stones end up toppling. But they're still there for all to see. And that's a very important part of our history. Although the Pony Express only ran for a short period of time out in these hills. And our old buck antelope, he's still around checking on things. He kind of keeps track of things around the place while we're out doing things. And, of course, he always does displays of power around on a sagebrush. That sagebrush is pretty good to fight. It doesn't fight back too much, and he can always claim that he's the winner. I hope that it's okay with the buck antelope, but I spread our petrified wood out on the table. First I washed it and then set it out on the table to dry and so we could look at it. Then we go on to explore a little more and we find a burrowing owl setting on a fence post as they like to do. These birds set on the fence posts a lot of times during the day 
and they move their whole head around because their eyeballs don't move, but they can sure swivel that head around in a hurry and look things over. And they hunt at night time, usually just finding and eating small rodents. So I guess our ground squirrels are in the clear, and we see his burrow right under the fence post where he was setting. He goes in there and does his owl things right in this burrow. We wanted to go to Willow Creek Hot Springs, but due to this coronavirus thing, a lot of people are off work, and gasoline has gone down in price. So lots of more people than I've ever seen at the hot springs and the desert. So we didn't go in the hot springs with all those people. And there were scads of people there. And they weren't doing their social distancing. So we just watched a few of the very beautiful dragonflies and some of the monkey flowers in a little marshy area and more of the little monkey flowers in the marsh grasses and some of the buckwheat family. Then we decided to go back out to Coyote Lake and check it out. Since the sky is real pretty today, we're going out there and do a little run on Coyote Lake. But I don't drive fast on the lake bed. Some people go out there and do, but uh, I, I don't see any need in it. I like to go a little bit slow and look the clouds and the scenery over. What a different place in the world this is. And this is real smooth and solid. The only thing, the playa has... A lot of little cracks on it. And when you buzz over there at a pretty decent speed, you can just hear it hum from crossing all these little cracks where as it dries, it shrinks and leaves all these chillions of little cracks. And the playa has enough minerals in it that when the sun hits it, it shines almost as if it were water. And the Steens Mountains are always standing guard in the background with, in most cases, a covering of clouds. After checking the playa out real good, having a great time driving around out there and looking at the scenery, I decided to go check out some of the old homestead houses. First, I came to an old house just across Willow Creek where it was built with no cut stones, just piled stones with mud for mortar, and they had no sawed lumber in it, not even a fireplace. Then I come to a spot on Willow Creek where all there is is a chimney. And this may have been a log building, but I prefer to think it was a sod building that dissolved. And it's right on the edge of Willow Creek, and just above it is a cave carved in to the softer rock. And I think the homesteaders probably carved that cave to use for something. And I don't know what, it could have been for storage or part of the family to sleep in, or it might have been a nice cool spot to be in the summer. The old chimney where the old sod house was is right on the edge of Willow Creek. So all their water they used for everything had to be dipped out of Willow Creek. But everyone used to drink out of creeks and rivers and lakes at that time, the Giardia hadn't yet came to this country, and you were usually pretty safe back then, up until the Vietnam War, when the Giardia came into this country and really raised havoc with these streams.
the current bush that must have been pretty important for these homesteaders is still growing there, producing currants. Then across, I notice under the protected areas where there are different bird nests, a lot of the biggest share of them are the cliff swallows, which build a complete nest. There's sort of a little hole you crawl in, and they were pretty active at this time, building in the protected areas of the cliff. And then there's some other holes. There's at least one uh, great horned owl nest here, and then there's a raven's nest, which has always been there. There's a hawk setting up on the cliff above. He must have a nest there too. From where the birds nest, I go on to some more old homesteads. There's a total of four old homesteads right here on Willow Creek where they had the water they could use and even some for irrigation. These homesteads are all built out of just whatever was in the area. There happened to be rocks, so they built them of rocks. Attached to the outhouse at Willow Creek Hot Springs, we find a barn swallow nest. He snuck in there and built it in a protected spot. I go back to where our camp is and the squirrels are at it again.